Hello, welcome to the High Bandwidth Word Podcast, Transformative Studies in the Word of God. Welcome to Season 8, and we're looking at this new topic, how to be unashamed. The Word of God talks in many places about being unashamed workmen. Paul said he's not ashamed to share the gospel of Christ. And one day we'll stand before the judgment seat of Christ. Will we be unashamed? Let's look at this subject. Let's try to understand it. Uh, welcome to Season 8. We, 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 we did just pray about grace and fruit of the Spirit. Just want, just want to say that. Second Corinthians chapter 4. I'll get my teacher voice going. We'll be good. So uh, we are looking at being unashamed. Um, and um, the, Paul says it in first Romans chapter 1 that I am not, I am not ashamed, right? And, and of the gospel of Jesus Christ, right? Because it is the power of God and salvation. It's something that changes lives. And Paul says, I'm not ashamed of that. We're, going to, we're continuing looking at theme, that idea, and so at the present moment, we're looking at being unashamed of the gospel, right? Preaching the gospel, the truth, and, and the, the devil doesn't like it, right? So in 2 Corinthians 4, look in verse 3, he says, if our gospel, But if our gospel be hid, it is hid to them that are what? That are lost. And whom the God of this world hath blinded the minds of them which believe not, lest the light of the glorious gospel of Christ, who is the image of God, should shine unto them. That is, the devil is active right? Um, hindering individuals from uh, seeing the truth of the gospel. They are in darkness, right? In fact, uh, the Apostle Paul tells us that when we got saved, we were translated, we were delivered from the power of darkness in the, in, and translated in the kingdom of his dear son, right? We were, we were removed from that darkness okay, that we were all under, right? And now we are, you know, in, in depending on your age, you know, for me, five or six, okay? It depends on some of you later, sometime, maybe some of you earlier uh, in life, and, uh, and he's blinded. But then he continues to work against, right? All right, and so Paul goes on to say in verse 5, For we preach not ourselves, but Christ Jesus the Lord, uh, the Lord uh, and ourselves your servants for Jesus' sake, okay? For God who commanded the light to shine out of darkness has shined in our hearts. So we, you know, we, we saw the light, right? We sing a song, like, oh, I saw the light, right? Okay. To give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God, in the face of Jesus Christ. And we have this treasure in earthen vessels, right? God intentionally has given it to us to deliver to others, right? And we are earthen vessels. That means that we're like clay pots, right? And it's easy to get cracked, okay? So, you know, it's, a, it's, a hard, it's, it's hard. But the reason is so that the excellency of the power may be of God and not of us. That is, it's always done in God's power. I mean, it's the power of God in the salvation. It's not the power of John to get you saved. It's the power, you know, it's the power of God. What I do, what you do, is you just share. You tell others what Christ did for you. It's not a complex thing, right? It's just about letting others know what Christ did for you. Share the gospel in, that, in the aspect that Christ died for their sins as well, and that he was buried and rose again, that they might have eternal life. It's God who works. God the Holy Spirit works, right? God the Holy Spirit's the one who changes lives. God's Holy Spirit's the one who lets individuals see and understand that Jesus Christ is Lord, that he's God himself, right? The Word of God is what we use because it's his word, his power, his authority. But the adversary, adversary doesn't like it. Verse 8, Paul says, In that context, we are troubled, what? On every side, okay? As, no matter what direction we look, there's trouble, right? Um, the um, book of Ecclesiastes sort of says this thing, man is born unto trouble, I think it says, right? That's just, it's just, the, it's just what's going to happen, right? Praise the Lord that you have Christ, right? Without Christ, that's true for every individual, but if you have Christ, you still have joy in the midst of trouble. That's why Paul says, we are troubled on every side, yet what? not distressed. We are perplexed, but not in despair. Persecuted, but not forsaken. Cast down, but not destroyed. Is, we, are, well, we have this dichotomy of experiences as believers in that we have this trouble, which is really just life, right? Okay? And then we add to that trouble sometimes because the devil doesn't like you. Okay, at all, right? So he's, he's also adding a little more attention to you. This is attention you don't want, right? But it's attention that we get, right? Um, but 
in verse 14, it says, Knowing that he which raised up the Lord Jesus shall raise up us also by Jesus and shall present us with you, right? That is, we know something. That's part of the reason why we have joy. In the midst of those things, we know that we're going to be raised up with Christ and we're going to be presented with him. For, for all things are for your sakes, that the abundant grace might through the thanksing of many redound to the glory of God. That is, God is still working all things together for good, even when there's trouble, even when there's difficulty, right? In fact, that's where God sometimes demonstrates his real power, where you see that he takes the difficult things or the things that the devil's doing and turns them for good. I mean, the greatest example of it is the crucifixion of Christ. You know, the devil thought he had a victory, right? But instead, that was God had worked that for good, right? And that's how salvation could be ever. Without, uh, without Christ dying for our sins, we don't have eternal life. We don't have hope, right? There'd be nothing without that truth, right? So there are, there, there's attacks. So, so we need to be equipped. So go to Ephesians 6. And we're going to dissect this later, uh, at least I believe, uh, sometime later, uh, a little more in, in how it sort of falls out. But the devil doesn't, I mean, well, the devil's at work. And we have a spirit, there's a spiritual battle. And that's, that's the, the devil's blind in the minds of them which believe not, right? He's a spirit that works in the children of disobedience, Ephesians 2. Ephesians 6, we're told in verse 10, to what? Finding my brethren, what? Be strong in the Lord. Because, see, it's his power, right? It's the excellence of his power. Be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. The word might. Has, is, is, the, is in the context of power, but it's the ability. You know, that is, God has ability, right? He, you know, we sing a song, He is able, right? Okay, that's, that's the idea. He is mighty. He's a mighty God. He's an ability God. He can do things, right? He does anything He chooses to do, right? He is a mighty God. And so we put, we're strong in the Lord and in the power of His might. Uh, in a physics sense, uh, power is, is energy and action. That is, energy is sort of the stuff to be, you know, you know, the ability to do work. Well, God works, right? He's always at work, and he works in his time, all right? And so he, he has power and ability, right? Um, so, so, but because, so how, do you, how are you strong in the Lord? Well, verse 11 says, put on the whole armor of God, right? Because the devil doesn't like you, okay? And he's going to bring stuff at you. Now, he can't indwell you. He can't forcibly take you out. Unless, but that's why he has to trick you, right? He's the Loki, if you're into, the, into uh, Norse god, gods. He's Loki. He's a, he's a trickster, right? Uh, put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles, the tricks, the crafty devices of the devil. Um, for we wrestle not against flesh and blood. However, you do wrestle with flesh and blood because the devil uses people, all right? He uses unbelievers, and individuals, believers, can be taken captive by the devil at his will, right? 2 Timothy 2. So, God, God, you know, so he, it's, but the, 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 the influence, the underlying part is the devil. We wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. Wherefore, because of that, take unto you the whole armor of God, then you may be able, able to withstand in what? The evil day, and having done all, what? Okay, so that verse means this. The idea of withstanding is there's buffeting happening, right? And you're standing, right? You're, you're, you know, it's, you're, you're standing. You're not knocked down. And when it's done, because it, that also means that the buffeting ceases for a season, right? That you're still standing, right? It just means that that's what, you know, you got to, you, got, you, know, you, you get a pause, but that doesn't mean it's done, you know? I know that um, we tend to pray hard when things are hard, right? And I was, I'm working on another book, just so you know that. But, and so you pray hard when, you, when, when, you, um, when things are hard, but actually we should pray harder when things are going well because that's when the devil's planning, plotting, planting seeds, getting ready for an next onslaught. I don't know if you've noticed in your life, but it's like, it's like waves happen every now and then. I mean, things just seem to go and fine, and all of a sudden it comes from all directions, okay? Multiple directions, okay? It's because 
there's been planning going on, right? It comes at you from work, comes at you from church, comes at you from your neighborhood. I mean, all in the same day, you know, all, like almost like in the same day, almost like Job. You know, it's like wave after wave, right? And that happens because, well, the devil is working, right? We need to be able to withstand and to stand, right? And when things are going well, I mean, Pastor Culp used to say it. Yeah, if, if you don't have any problems right now, just wait. I mean, I, I think that's the quote or something very close to that, all right? That's the reality of it because it's, it's not that it might happen. It will happen, all right? It's just, it's just the, you know, it, it is the truth of the fact that you're a child of God and the devil doesn't like you, right? Now, if you act just like the world, you might skate through because he's not worried about you, all right? But if you stand up, yea, all that live godly shall suffer persecution, right? That is a truth, right? In that context, God says, be not ashamed, right? Be, you know, don't be ashamed of the gospel because it's the power of God to deliver people from that. It's the power of God. It enables you to keep on continuing on, right? Um, I'm gonna, we're going to look at the se- Second Timothy, and we're going to look at Second Timothy in a way you've never looked at it before, all right? Uh, and it's a way that just sort of I came to understand in the last, like, I don't know, six, seven months, all right? Uh, and it's about being not ashamed, because that's, that's, that's a huge theme of it. In fact, it's the theme. I think it is the theme. It, well, the theme that people sometimes say, again, it's about faithfulness, all right? But if you take a look at what Paul's saying, it's about not being ashamed, really, at the judgment seat of Christ, right? Paul's not going to be ashamed because he fought a good fight. He finished his course. He kept the faith, right? Henceforth, there is later for me a crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, shall give me at that day, and not to me only, but also all them that also love his appearing. That is, God's, 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 God's desire is that we show up. It's about the judgment seat of Christ. That's the culminating passage of that of, of, of second timothy we focus on second timothy 2 15 study to show thyself to prove unto god a workman that needeth not to be ashamed all right it's about not being ashamed before god all right so god says don't be ashamed paul says don't be ashamed that I'm, I'm not ashamed of the gospel of christ it's the power of god and salvation right don't be and paul tells timothy the exact same thing in second timothy 2 he says you know he says in verse 7 God has not given us the spirit of fear, but of power and of love and a sound mind. And then read the next verse and say, don't be ashamed of me. Don't be ashamed of the testament of the Lord Jesus Christ. And don't be ashamed of my chain, who, what's going on in my life. It's about not being ashamed. We're not going there just yet, but we're getting there, all right? So 2 Timothy, to me, is a very powerful pass, or book about, really, what God's desire is for children. His last, Paul's last words, it's about focusing on what's really important. You know, I've, you know, I've thought about that. You know, what, are your la- what were the last words you want to say to somebody if you know it was the last time you said them? You know, I did it at St. Francis when I retired. What were the last words I said to the folks up there, right? Okay, they're important, okay, what, what you say. If it's the last time we're going to see somebody, what's the last words I'm going to say, right? What would be my last message that I would preach? You know, you, know, you need to go back and listen to Pastor Stewart's last message he preached as full-time pastor of the church. Pretty impacting message, right? Because he thought about it, right? Because, you know, what do I want to say? Because I don't know if I'm going to have other words to say, right? But what are my last words? Well, Paul, these are last, Paul's last words, and he knew they were going to be his last words, right? And so, so what's important? Let's go see how the devil tries to work at you, okay? We're just going to just look at a couple places, uh, and the book of Acts is where we're going to go. Uh, go to Acts 14. Okay, so how does, you know, so like, so how does the devil attack a child of God, all right? I mean, he can't indwell you, right? He can't, so like, so what attacks could you expect, all right? Uh, and uh, we just glance at them real quickly. I don't want to spend tons of time here. Um, I did a series of messages here a long time ago from the pulpit when Pastor Ken Peebles was here on Wednesday night, and it was, I, it was called, We Are Not Ignorant of His Devices. It was about 12 messages on how the devil operates, how Satan operates. And I really went through the book of Acts here and, and, and dissected these, these attacks. Everywhere Paul went, guess what happened right when Paul, you know, after Paul got there? Problems, right? Difficulties. He was attacked, right? Okay? But he was not ashamed 
he was in danger, his life was at stake, but he wasn't ashamed, right? Sometimes he fled because he had to. Sometimes his friends said, you got to get out of here. It's too hot, right? Uh, but adversity followed him. It didn't mean he was doing anything wrong. It's just, you know, all this fire was happening around him, but it wasn't him. You know, he was, he was just, you know, being, being who God called him to be, I'm not ashamed, right? Just, just we'll look at, I'll just look at a couple, and we'll, and we'll skip on past here. Uh, Acts 14. We could have went in Acts 13, and where you have this one individual trying to keep somebody from receiving the gospel, and then Paul, uh, well, God, or Paul blinds him for a season. Acts 14, verse 1. And it came to pass in Iconium that they were, went both together into the synagogue of the Jews, and so spake, and this is Paul and Barnabas, that a great multiple of both of the Jews and also the Greeks believed. Now notice this. But the unbelieving Jews stirred up the Gentiles and made their minds evil, affected against what? The brethren. So what's that saying there? Because, well, well, first what we're saying is Paul went in the Iconium, he went into the synagogue, preached to the Jews that were inside and the Greeks that were right outside, and many believed, right? But then the unbelieving Jews stirred up the Gentiles, and those Gentiles are the believing Gentiles, because they are, they are, they were, they were, um, made their minds evil against the brethren, right? They, they became, so they came in and they stirred up the Gentiles against the, the believing Jews. So the unbelieving Jews stirred up the believing Gentiles to be upset about the believing Jews. That's what's going on there. That is, so the unbelievers came in and they riled up some folks. Okay, in this case, they were believers. You know, maybe telling them, you know, what, what the Jews over there really think or something like that. I don't know what it was, but, but it caused problems, right? Verse 3 says, Long time therefore, therefore, because of that, therefore abode, they speaking boldly in the Lord, which gave testimony unto the word of grace and granted signs and wonders to be done by their hands. But the multitude of the city was divided, and part held with the Jews, and part held with what? The apostles. So those Jews would be the unbelieving Jews, right? And part with the apostles, meaning Paul and Barnabas in this case. And when there was an assault made both of the Gentiles and also the Jews with their rulers to use them despitefully and to stone them, they were, they were, they were aware of it and fled unto Lystra and Derby, cities of Lyconia, um, and uh, under the region that lieth round about. And verse 7, just a very short verse, says what? And there they preached the gospel, right? They could, so the gospel created contention, right? But the issue is that you have, you have individuals stirring up other individuals, right? Unbelievers. And who's the spirit that works in the children, uh, children, of, uh, children of disobedience? Satan. The devil, Satan, right? He's the one. He's the motivator. He's the, he's the, he's the, the you know, the, the principality, the powers that we're to worry about. It's a spiritual conflict working behind the scenes. Uh, in... Um, uh, I, I, you know, I, I think it's interesting if you continue reading verse four, chapter 14 you have uh, he, uh, they get into a town and they want to worship Paul and Barnabas like gods and then literally like you know 10 minutes later uh, in, uh, in verse 19 and there came thither certain Jews from Antioch and Iconium who persuaded the people and what did they do? and having stoned Paul so like you're a god, and now we stone you, and then to drag you out of the city, right? But what happened was, it wasn't like those, those individuals were fine with Paul. They loved Paul. But you have some people that came down that somehow, you know, the devil had gotten a hold of, okay? And they came down, and they stirred up the, um, pretty, pretty well, right? To have them stone them, right? Stirred them up and, and stoned Paul, all right? Go to chapter 17. Just... Uh, so the devil is working, so he uses unbelievers, all right? So if you have a lot of unbelievers in your life, you work with some folks, okay, that may be that case, uh, they can be used to stir, you know, stir up against you, all right? That can work against you. Um, even, uh, even believers, that's what the, the Gentiles are stirred up against the, the believing Jews, right? Um, what, 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 would mo what, a mo what would be the motivation, yeah, what 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 would they what would they why would they not like their brothers in Christ that were Jews? Well, let's think about it. Go to chapter seventeen. Might answer a question for you. All right, chapter seventeen, verse one. <coughs> well, now when they had passed through Amphipolis and Apollonia, they came to Thessalonica, 
where it was a synagogue of the Jews. And Paul, as his manner was, went in unto them, and three Sabbath days reasoned with them out of the Scriptures. For about three weeks, right? Opening and alleging that Christ must needs have suffered and risen again from the dead, and that Jesus, whom I preach, whom I preach unto you, is Christ. He shared the gospel, right? And some of them believed and consorted with Paul and Silas, and of the devout Greeks a great multitude, and of chief women not a few. So there was a lot of individuals that, that uh, uh, became believers, and, they, and they, they, they consorted, they hung out with them, right? But the Jews, which what? Believed not. And here's the motivation. Moved with what? Envy, right? They moved with envy. They didn't like it, right? Their authority was being, you know, instead of them consorting with them and talking to them, because they were like, you know, I mean, they were the, I mean, think about it, what Paul said, before grace, the difference between Jews and Gentiles was enormous, right? The Jews had everything. The Gentiles had nothing. They had no hope in the world. And now they have hope, and it doesn't involve Israel, okay? You know, it doesn't involve that nation. But the Jews, which believed not, moved with envy, and then they took unto them certain lewd fellows, I mean, of the baser sort, basically some rude, crude individuals, all right, individuals that didn't mind getting their knuckles dirty, all right, and gathered a company and set all the city in an uproar, and they assaulted the house of Jason and sought to bring out to, to uh, bring them out to the people. So they uh, they just they they came with like you know fierceness, right? Okay, uh, down in verse. Um, um, seven, whom, J whom Jason received, and these do all contrary to the decrees of Caesar, saying that there is another king out of one Jesus. They began to talk, you know, saying what, you know, how they stirred the people up was by saying, you know, giving them partial truth here. And they troubled the people and the rulers of the city when they heard these things. And when they had taken security of Jason and the others, they let them go. It was, you know, the, but basically they sort of arrested and, and stopped some things. But anyways, it's about stirring people, and envy is one of the big motivators that the devil uses, right? That's what the Gentiles, you know, the Jews came in and stirred up the Gentiles against the, the Jews, right? Uh, it's about envy and jealousy and uh, pride. Those are all the things that, that occur. Acts 19, just um, buzzing through here and picking out some passages that are relatively clear. Verse 8. Acts 19, verse 8. I mean, they're now, um, um, well, they're, they're near Ephesus, I believe. Verse 8. And he went into the synagogue and spake boldly, talking to Paul, and he went into the synagogue and spake boldly for the space of three months, disputing and persuading the things concerning the kingdom of God. But when divers were hardened, okay, and what? Believe, believe not, but spake evil of that way, talking about the way of, you know, Jesus Christ is the way, before the multitude, he departed from them and separated the disciples, disputing daily in the school of one Tyrannus. So what, what happened was individuals began, like, there was response at the beginning. People were listening. People were getting saved. And then you had people who were beginning hardened to it, and then they became active against it, all right? All right? And again, they're unbelievers, okay? And they began to speak evil. So Paul said, okay, we're going to depart from them. He separates the disciples. He basically, the believers come with him, all right? And he goes and goes into school of one Tyrannus. And this continued by the space of, space of what? Two years. So that all they which dwelt in Asia heard the word of the Lord Jesus, both Jews and Greeks, right? So for two years, he was over in the school of Tyrannus. And a school is, you know, the idea is sending people out, okay? They were, so they basically covered all of Asia, right? That would be Turkey uh, and, uh, and, uh, and, and those areas. Um, God, God, you know, God works, the devil doesn't like it, all right? Down in verse 23, it says this. Um, it's just, you know, there's always a stir, okay? And, and at the same time, there arose no small stir about that way, okay? For a certain man named Demetrius, a silversmith, which made silver shrines for Anna, brought no small gain unto the craftsmen, whom he called together with the workmen of like occupation, said, Sirs, ye know that by this craft we have our wealth. And you keep on reading, and Paul is jeopardizing our wealth, all right? That's an issue of like, okay, now we're going to, you're, you're affecting my livelihood, right? I think Hitler used this thought, all right? You know, the idea is that, you know, they're jeopardizing, there's a nation of individuals that are jeopardizing our wealth, our security, our whatever, and they picked on the Jews, all right? And he used that to raise the power. Well, this is, you know, it's a, 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 
a you know, natural, demonic, devilish way of doing things. You affect me somehow, so I'm going to smack you. In this case, unbelievers, look at that and, and see that uh, that's the case, right? And uh, anyways, they, um, you know, they, there was a, a big uproar and all that type of stuff, and, uh, and, um, but it's how, how the devil operates, right? And finally, in Acts 20, verse 24, after looking at all these difficulties and these problems and all the things that are happening, if you start in verse 22, And now, behold, I go bound in the Spirit unto Jerusalem, this is the Apostle Paul speaking, not knowing the things that shall befall me there, save that the Holy Ghost witnesses in every city, saying that bonds and afflictions abide me, but none of these things move me. Right? Neither count I my life dear unto myself, so that I might finish my course with joy in the ministry which I have received the Lord Jesus to testify what? The gospel of the grace of God. As Paul said, I'm still going to keep going. All right? Doesn't matter all the things that happen. Doesn't you know, all, all the problems. Doesn't matter what the Spirit says is going to happen. I'm still going to go preach the, the gospel of, of Jesus Christ. All right? It's, it's, it's the path that, uh, that God put Paul on. He says, it's my calling. It's what I'm called to do. We're all called to be ambassadors of Christ, and we're all told to be unashamed of that gospel, the truth that, you know, that Christ died for us. So go to 2 Timothy then. All right? So we'll start there. So the devil, because uh, he's the underlier, um, typically you know, if, if there are other places we get a read where those came down from Jerusalem and stirred up the saints, stirred up the people and stuff like that. The devil operates through individuals, typically unbelievers, but can also work through believers. The Gentiles, in that case, were also aff afflicted, right? In 2 Timothy, let's, let's start looking at some pa passages there. You know, they're all of Asia heard, right? In verse 15 of 2 Timothy 1, This thou knowest that all they which are in Asia, what? Be turned away from me of whom is Phygelus uh, and Hermogenes, right? Uh, it was short-lived, right? You know, there was some time. Everybody heard. That didn't mean everybody believed. But there were lots of believers, all right? And Paul says, there ain't one left that hasn't turned away from me, right? And Paul's saying that to Timothy because he's letting him know that there are problems ahead, right? It doesn't matter what you do, okay? Because in the, con the context is, um, in verse um, 12, for, which for the which cause I also suffer these things, nevertheless I am not ashamed, for I know whom I have believed and persuaded he is able to keep that which I have committed unto him against that day. Right? And then he tells Timothy, hold fast the form of sound words which thou hast heard of me in faith and love which is in Christ Jesus. That good thing which was committed unto thee, keep by the Holy Ghost which dwelleth in us, this thou knowest. That it's hard, right? It's hard. And it's disappointing sometimes, right? I mean, you think, I mean, I'm sure that Paul was not, that was not a pleasant thing to understand, too, that all the work seems to have gone to loss, but it hasn't. Because the Word of God is not bound. The Word of God produces fruit. It's just that the leadership, and that's what they're talking about, Phygelus and Hermogenes are significant leaders in that region of the world, and they're working against Paul, to turn people away, right, um, to, from that truth. So let's look at first Tim, or Second Timothy. All right, and we'll start in verse seven. <clears throat> I'm telling you that I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna take you through t t Timothy real quick, and then we'll maybe re revisit. It. I guess I don't know. We'll see what I'm gonna do. I don't know. I never know what I'm gonna do. Second Timothy one verse seven. For God has not given us the spirit of fear, but of power and of love and a sound mind. Paul tells Timothy in verse 6, I put thee in remembrance that thou stir up the gift of God which is in thee by the putting on of thy hands. My hands, that is, you know, Paul, you, Timothy, you have a gift, right? You're a pastor, you're a teacher, you are, you know, you're a, um, uh, a sent one, a called one of God. Um, and um, Paul says in verse 5, I remember the unfeigned faith that is in thee, which would dwelt first in thy grandmother Lois and thy mother Eunice. And I'm persuaded in thee, that in thee also. I mean, you, you come from faithful line of individuals. You, you, have, you have great examples in your life of faithfulness. And I believe it's in you too, Tim, right? And, and I want you to remember what God has done and given you, right? 
Paul said, he continues to repeat it and says, I'm called to be an apostle. I'm called to be an apostle. I'm called. He's reminding himself, right? That's who he is, reminding others. Well, Timothy, I want to remind you who you are, right? You're, you're a called one of God. You're, 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 you are um, uh, called to do this. And God didn't give us a spirit of fear, but of power and love and a sound mind. Verse 8. Be not thou, what's the next word? Therefore. Be not thou therefore ashamed of the testimony of our Lord, nor of me of his prisoner. Right? So the first thing is he says to him, don't you be ashamed. Therefore. Okay? Because shame comes from fear. Right? It comes from fear. God's not given a spirit of fear, but a power and love and a sound mind. Be not thou therefore ashamed. Is that God, you know, what, what fear does is create shame. You, you turn from, you hide from in fear, right? God didn't give you fear, okay? That comes from your flesh, and the devil can use it, all right? He can, he can you know, shut you down when we become afraid. Um, I've been afraid sometimes. I mean, I get, I mean, I'll be honest with you, I, I get afraid of heights today. I've told you that before, and I think I've told you a story where um, I, I built a two-car garage back at our old, old homestead in, in Newry, and uh, put the walls up, laid the concrete, laid the block, had somebody come and pour the foundation, but I did the rest of it, all right? Laid all the block, put in the trusses, which my brother on said was terribly done, because he's a carpenter. He had to come back and re he, he put the roof on finally because I couldn't do it. Um, put it all up, put the trusses up, got them all framed in, put all the plywood on, had the last piece of plywood to put on, it had like a little hole at the end, okay? And um, I went to get up on the roof to do that, and I couldn't get out of the rafters, right? I mean, I could stand, as long, I'm standing on a 10 or 12 foot ladder, you know, above the ground, but I was between the rafters. But when I tried to crawl out on, it was like I froze. I mean, I couldn't do it. I mean, when I was dating Penny, we put roofs on homes. We tore off shingles. I stood on slopes, like, I don't know, like five, 12 slopes, which are pretty steep, okay? Uh, and, you know, hung over the edge, ripped off flashing, you know, laid down shingles on it. Not a problem. But somewhere around 40, 40, you know, 40, 40, 45, all of a sudden my mind says, you break, I guess, okay? <laughs> you know, you, you, you're gonna, you, you, you can break really easy, okay? You're not, you don't bounce like you used to do. I look like I bounce, but I don't bounce like I used to do, right? And um, I, I mean, honestly, it was like I sat there and I talked to myself. I said, this is stupid. This is ridiculous. You're on a 312 slope. It's not even, I mean, it's like this. It's like, you know, there's probably more slope in the building here because it sagged. I mean, I don't know. It's just, but it was just in my head. I couldn't, I couldn't get over it. I, and I, I, it was like two hours. It was, it was at least that long. I, I sat there and tried to get out. I had to get back off. My heart wouldn't stop. And so I went into the house and told Penny, said, call Jesse, see if he can help, because I, you know, I, I can't get on the roof, right? And um, it, was, it was a really hard thing to admit, but it was fear. Fear stops you. I had no power, all right? I couldn't, my mind wouldn't stop, okay? I had no sound mind. My mind was racing, and I, I, I had no love, because I only concerned about me. You know, and I was worried. I was okay to put Penny's brother up on the roof, okay? But, uh, you know, I, I wasn't. But it, 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 it just, it was, you know, it shut me down. And that's what fear does. And fear makes us ashamed when we worry about things that maybe happen. Because it didn't happen. Nothing happened. I was just, I was, I was probably safer on the roof than I was on the ladder, okay? But between the rafters, I felt secure. I was hugged by the rafters. Even to the whole point of my ankles, but then when the ankles got and the feet got on the roof, that's when the problem happened, right? I just sat there. Well, fear stops us. It makes us ashamed, all right? It can make us ashamed. Be not thou therefore ashamed at a testimony of our Lord. That's the gospel, testifying what the Lord Jesus Christ has done for each and every one of us, right? And then Paul goes on to say to Timothy, nor of me his prisoner, my message, what I'm sharing, right? Don't, you know, don't, don't be ashamed of the fact that I'm in prison, or I'm, I'm, you know, I'm in this case, he's in prison, right? But don't be ashamed of, of, of what's happening to me, right? But be thou a partaker of the afflictions of the gospel. A partaker is somebody who goes out and runs into it, right? You don't be an avoider, 
right, of, of afflictions, but you be a partaker of the afflictions of the gospel. Again, according to the power of God, right? Okay. God's power is what will sustain you and I through it, but we have to be not ashamed, right? We, don't, we can't let our flesh guide us or, 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 or be the driver because it'll become fearful, and the devil will use it. He'll magnify it. You know, fear does that. It magnifies things and makes them look huge, right? It's like you're in, a, you're in a house all by yourself and you hear a sound, okay? okay? I remember um, 60th anniversary of this church, or maybe, it's, no, 50th anniversary of this church. Uh, I took a, a bunch of Pastor Culp's video, uh, film uh, from his messages. Uh, re- uh, they had them on, it was 16 millimeter film. We had a camera up there at one time. So I worked during the day, so I came in, and, and to get ready for it, I wanted to uh, put together some, I was asked to do some video from back, vintage video from back in the late 50s, all right? And so I set up a projector, I set up a camcorder, I set up the 16 millimeter camera upstairs up here in, in this little side room. We had stacks of film, uh, and uh, I loaded them up, and I would record them, and then I went through them later and cut out like, interesting pieces, right? But I did it at night, and so I'm here at like, honestly, one, two, three o'clock in the morning um, doing it, and um, this building creaks. It makes some of the most interesting sounds late at night, okay? And um, when you're here all by yourself and you're in the dark, okay, a little sound can sound really suspicious. Is the building coming down? <laughs> Is there somebody else in this building that you don't know about, right? So it's like fear makes things huge, right? That aren't that big, right? It's just that our mind plays with it, right? It messes with our mind, right? Paul says, don't be fearful. Don't be ashamed of the testimony of our Lord, nor of me as prisoner, but be thou a partaker. You know, get in the conflict of the afflictions of the gospel, which basically says that it's a guarantee, okay? It's not like sharing the gospel is not going to cause some sort of... of um, rift. I mean, the Word of God is, is uh, edgy, all right? It's a divider, all right? It doesn't, it says you're either saved or not saved. You're either going to hell or you're going to go to heaven. You're either a child of God or you're not a child of God, right? It's a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. This is right, this is wrong, this is, you know, this is love and this is evil or, you know, whatever. It, it discerns. The Word of God is the discerner. Okay, Hebrews 4.12 says that. It divides, it cuts, okay? Even the Bible, even when we're we're dealing with the Word of God, 2 Timothy 2.15 is about cutting the Word of God straight. It's either for you or not for you. It's, you know, it's, it's, uh, you know, it's, you know, it's, it's a, it, 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 it has an edge to it, right? And so it, it causes conflict, okay? Actually, it doesn't cause the conflict, but the world that hates it and the devil that hates it causes the conflict. It shows that it shines light. Now, the Lord Jesus Christ, hold your place there. Go to John one. It, I I know it is. I I felt those words coming. So I could have prophetically said that. I appreciate that, Marcia. Okay. The Lord Jesus Christ is an edge. All right. And so you know, are you going to be on a partaker of the afflictions that happen because people don't like what? it says, or in this case, they don't like the light, right? John 1, 1, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. The same was in the beginning with God. All things were made by Him, and without Him was not anything made that was made. In Him was life, and the life was the light of men, and the light shineth in darkness. What does it say there? And the light, sh- er, 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 and the darkness comprehended it not. There was a man sent from God who was... W- whose name was John, the same came for a witness to bear witness of the light that all men through him might believe. He was not the light, but was sent to bear witness of the light. That was the true light, which lighteth every man that cometh into the world. He was in the world, and the world was made by him, and the world knew him not. This is Christ is the light, and he shines in darkness, and the, light, the darkness doesn't like it, right? You know, I mean, when you're camping and some stupid kid points a flashlight in your face, you don't like that, right? Okay? Happens all the time when we're out with kids, you know, it's like, stop it, get that flashlight out of my face, right? <laughs> now, you just don't like your eyes being blinded, right? 
But the world doesn't like to be blinded by the light. And the light's the Lord Jesus Christ, right? And so when you share the light, and they're in darkness, you expose things, right? And there's conflict, and there's adversity, and there are afflictions. And we are called, Timothy is called, to be a partaker of the afflictions of the gospel. And by the way, it says, according to the power of God. It's not like you're left alone, right? It's at the same level. You know, God's power will sustain okay, us through anything like that. So don't be ashamed of the gospel. And Paul said, don't be ashamed of him himself. We're going to talk more about that next time. Let's pray. Father God, we're thankful for your goodness and your grace. We thank you for your word. We thank you for your blessings. Thank you, Lord, for just everything you've done uh, for us. Uh, Lord, we know, Lord, that you are a great God and worthy to be praised. And, Father, we just look forward to what you're going to do today. Pray for Pastor Aaron, Lord. Give him the words to speak. Give us a ten of hearts and minds. Let your spirit, Lord, convict us today of who we ought to be. And thank you, Lord, for your, what you're going to do. In Christ Jesus' name, amen. You've been listening to the High Bandwidth Word Podcast, Transformative Studies in the Word of God. I hope you've enjoyed the study. Please subscribe, like, and comment. This podcast is available on many podcast platforms. Just search on the title. Now, until next time, fight the good fight of faith and God's best to you.